welcome to Megacity London, ever growing, ever more unequal. I'm delighted to see all of you here tonight. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Linda Butcher, the Chief Executive of the Sheila McKechnie Foundation, or SMK, as we're more often known. For those of you who don't know much about us, we're a small and unique charity that works across the whole of the UK, and we help individuals, groups, and communities to speak up and take effective action on issues that matter to them and to others. Now, this is the first in a series of networking events that we're hoping to hold. Um, and we're really fortunate tonight to have Danny Dorling, who's a professor of human geography at the University of Sheffield. And we also have Dr. Ben Hennig, who's also at Sheffield. And he works on geospatial data analysis and geovisualization. Our title is Ever More Growing, Ever More Unequal. And what we're really doing for the Trust for London, or funded by the Trust for London, is not only looking at the latest statistics and data and how the trends in London change over time, but what we are all also trying to do is really to, um, to find better ways of visualizing these trends to make them more understandable um, for a broader range of people and more interesting. This is a normal map for London and you have to keep these colours in mind because what we're doing is we're changing the shape of these maps to a certain extent to actually make comprehensible what the numbers behind all the statistics that we get from the census and from other sources um, are based on. This is not the real map of London as it is in terms of population, in terms of an unequal city. This is just the shape of London, how it looks to us when we fly over it. If you change our view and look where all of you are living in London, then it gets slightly twisted to a certain extent because it actually shows you the boroughs of London resized according to how many people live in each of the boroughs. And this is the real map of London as a mega city. That's a quite simple definition if a city has more than 5 or 8 or 10 million um, population then it is just called a mega city. But what makes London really interesting as a sort of mega city in the in the old Western wealthy world is that it has started to grow again at a rate that many other cities in the West don't grow. It doesn't quite reach the sort of growth that you see in mega cities in Asia for example but it is very unusual if you look at the growth in cities in Europe. And what makes London quite unusual as well is, is, it, is its certain demographic structure. As you can see here on the population pyramid of London taken from the latest census, probably not unsurprising, you see a certain peak in the late 20s and early 30s, what we have in, in many bigger cities, but at a much higher proportion than, again, you see it in many other Western European cities. And then this little peak down there at the youngest age groups is quite unusual for such a large city in this part of the world as well. And if you take this population pyramid and look at where all these people are in London, we see certain geographical patterns, spatial patterns that actually define the city. These are the different age groups from the population pyramid and where they live in London. And what we can see is this high concentration of the youngest of people who are looking for high aspirations in the city for future um, perspectives being concentrated in the core parts of the city. This is what this animation shows. This just gives you a very brief overview of what kind of maps we're drawing and that you should get used to when you're actually listening to Danny now who will be talking about how the spatial patterns do not only relate to population but how this relates to um, poverty and wealth distribution. Uh, thanks very much, Ben, and thanks to Trust London for helping us to do this. When the census came out uh, last summer, in June, July, the very first thing it revealed was that unlike the previous two censuses, which told us that there were a million less people living in the country than we believed there were, because people quietly leave, uh, there were half a million more people than we had thought there were, and only the census told us that. And of course these people, these extra people, were concentrated in the southeast of England and in particular London. And two thirds of them were women. That was new. Without a census you wouldn't know that this acceleration in population in London really was happening unlike in anywhere else in the west of Europe. You have to go back. In every other recession we've had, uh, Britain has had higher emigration than immigration. You have to go back to the 1930s to get a pattern similar to now. In 2007, with about 10 colleagues, we produced a report on poverty and wealth taking the 1971, 81, 91 and 2001 censuses. And we took 
what are called breadline surveys that were taken around the time of those censuses and tried to estimate how many people were wealthy and how many people were poor in each part of Britain and how it was changing. And we produced maps like the ones you can see there. And the big kind of story when this was released in 2007 was that we were getting some red areas. The red areas are areas where over half the population were poor. And the definition of poverty was Peter Townsend's definition of relative poverty. You're poor if you cannot uh, partake in the, in the norms of life, if you can't do what most people think you should be able to do. And the way you work that out is you survey the population and you ask them a whole set of questions. Should people be able to have a pair of shoes? Should children have a warm winter coat and so on? And then you see how many people don't have those. So we use those surveys and the censuses to try to work out how many people are poor and rich in areas. Now what we've done here is to update this for 2011. The data we used was released, I think, around about December the 11th. So it's only been out for about four weeks. Uh, we thought this might be some of the first analysis, but we were beaten by the University of Manchester. What the University of Manchester produced by comparing 2011 and 2001 was they showed that for every, eth every ethnic group, including white, which was unusual, and for every religious group in Britain, apart from people of Jewish religion, they were becoming more mixed geographically. So this country is mixing more. It's more socially liberal, if you like. Um, now, unlike the population figures, which were a surprise, that we kind of expected or hoped for. Um, by the way, if you're interested in why there might be a slight polarisation in people of Jewish religion, it's probably births. It's not people flocking in, particularly as it's more babies being born and people not dying. So, census has told us two things already. It's told us that there are more people than we thought there were coming in faster and the population is, is going up and accelerating slightly in London. It's told us that nationally across the whole of the country we're getting more mixing in places, more people moving around, less areas people feel they can't get into. So the third question is, what's happening to us economically? What's happening in terms of where rich and poor are? Now for that Roundtree report done back in 2007, <coughs> we came up with a number of, of definitions. Uh, the definitions we came up with was a group of people who are very poor, people who are poor no matter how you count poverty. They think they're poor themselves, they have low income, and they have low assets as well. Then the big group is the breadline poor. These are people who are poor in terms of a consensual survey where most people in Britain would say they're poor having heard their circumstances. We then have a group in the middle, then we then have a group who are asset wealthy, which probably may be quite a few of you, um, particularly if you're older, because the other gap that's widening is, is by age. And that's people who, if you were to um, not make it out of this building tonight, uh, would be liable for inheritance tax. Now, most people who would be liable for inheritance tax by the time they die aren't. It's only 7%. And the last group, which people are always seem particularly interested in and are more interested in, are the opposite to Townsend's breadline people. These are people who can exclude themselves from the norms of society by dint of their wealth. People who can, don't need to use state schools, don't need to use the health service, can buy brand new cars and so on. And we did an estimate of, of this kind of group. We published an equation back then, and this was the equation for 2001. And it's a way of producing a best estimate for any small area of how many people would be breadline poor, given the kind of things that are asked in the census. Now, this isn't saying that this proportion of people in these groups are poor. It would actually be a higher proportion that are poor. It's saying that if you've got this census data in 2001 for an area, and you want to try to estimate what a breadline survey would produce, this is the best estimate to use. These are the best variables to use from the census. So all I'm going to do, and we thought this was a fairly legitimate test, is apply the same equation using 2011 data to see what's happened for London. And you can see the kind of things included are, are people overcrowded? Are you renting for local authority? Are you a lone parent household? Are you unemployed? Do you have no car? Are you renting from a private landlord? Have you got an illness? Have you got no central heating? Or are you in a low paid job? Those are the kind of things. The census is much, much worse at wealthy people. It's not, it's not designed to single out those on uh, who are doing very well. The census is always often about concern that are down in society and not up. But the kind of indicators in the census that help us try to work out where the wealthy are, 
is how many people are of high social class, how many people are owner occupied, how many people have no dependent children. Head of household in work helps, of course, seven or more rooms, which fortunately we can't, haven't yet got for 2011, two or more cars. It's very crude. You can obviously get other data, but the nice thing is we're replicating what we did in 2001. We're only going to look at the breadline poor and the exclusive wealthy and the group in the middle, including the asset wealthy, because we don't have house price data that's up to date enough to be able to do that. And of course, here are the first of the maps, and the static maps won't be a great surprise to many of you. The highest rates of poverty, now up to 60%, 66% of people in the worst off borough in London are, of course, in the centre of London towards the east. This scale only applies to poverty, by the way. The exclusive, so this is 2001, I'll show you 2011 in a second, the exclusive wealthy down to the southwest and the middle squeezed out to the edge. Here's 2011. Let's go back again so you can see the difference. Essentially, there's been an increase in breadline poverty. There are more poor people in London, uh, but most of the increase has been on the outside. There's been a slight increase of exclusive wealthy, and there's been a decrease of people in the middle. The brown is showing the increases, so the increase in poverty is in the outer boroughs. Still much better off, but that's where the increase is. Other things have shown this happening. It's just the census confirming it. The biggest increase in exclusive wealthy is here, in this large part of central London, and the only part to get an increase of people in the middle is just north and south of the river here. Here we've stretched London. There are exclusive wealthy people in every borough, but these are the boroughs drawn to create a kind of map of equality, so they're all, the area of each borough is a portion of exclusive wealthy. And if I click through to middle, you'll see how the shape changes, and if I click through again to breadline poor, you'll see a very different London. This is London of people in low-income households, London shaped by people with long-term health problems or disability, London where every area is done by households with no adult in employment, Londoners who have no central heating, we've done it in order so it gets larger each time. Private rented London is this, this kind of shape. Overcrowded London is that what it looks like. And then that's no car London. And renting from a local authority London. So there's a breadline poverty map, poor London that we produced for 2011. And that's probably of more interest, that's the map of the increase. So these are the new poor over 10 years. Nowhere has poverty gone down, I'm fairly sure. It's gone up everywhere, partly because people have gone up everywhere, partly because London has polarised. And it could have gone down somewhere. If I go back to the population data, the very simple counts that first came out from the census, one of the most remarkable things was despite this rapid growth in population of London and the South East, one borough went down in population. And that's Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, and it's, it's absolutely stunning that that, 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 can, that that can occur in the midst of such demand for housing. Uh, and it obviously is because of the house prices. We have lots more maps to produce. Uh, we have lots more detailed maps. So far, only the borough level, da level data has been released from the census. At the end of this month, all the ward level data will be released from the census. This is a map of the index of multiple deprivation. On the population cartogram, so we've got rid of the Royal Parks and everywhere else where people don't live, we're giving poor London its fair share of the map, in a way, by making everybody have an equal amount of space. But we're going to be drawing lots and lots of these maps, or a bit more fairly, I should say, Ben will be drawing lots of these maps, and I'll be trying to write something about what on earth they show. So what these early results from the 2011 census suggest is that the same trend that occurred between 81 and 91 and 91 and 2001 of polarisation has occurred again between 2001 and 2011. Now this is all before all those policies that have come in since, the housing benefit changes so on. This is 10 years of new labour this has occurred under. So what we, well, what at least I feel, Mubi may feel differently, and benefit differently, I think it is given what we've found so far there is nothing wrong with simply rolling this forward another 10 years and another 20 years forward because it's been going on for 30 years now. So in all likelihood we're going to carry on seeing this polarisation increase unless we do something about it. One nice thing about the earlier project I was involved in is that we could go back to 1971. And by going back to 1971 we found it was possible 
to have a decade in which things do not become more unequal. The 1971 to 81 decade was actually a decade of somewhat equalisation, if very grey and depressing. Um, the rich in London didn't get richer in most of the 1970s. And if you look back further in time, of course, London was incredibly unequal in the 1920s and 30s, and then became progressively more equal. The very big houses were cut up into flats. That's what happens when you become more equal. When you become more unequal, they take the flats, knock them all out, and create a townhouse and charge 100 million pounds for it again. Despite a government and a party in power wishing to change a trend, and we have yet to do measurements and to work out you know, was there any slowdown in the polarisation or was there any increase? From 2001 to 2011, it appears that that process of London dividing and pulling apart was continuing anyway, even before what we expect to happen now, that people who no longer can afford through housing benefits to live in London start moving out, and even before and the, a lot of the increased flood of the super-rich into the middle of London, it was already polarising. We are... Up to then, living in a country which, as far as we can tell so far, didn't show a slowdown in the kind of growth of London and the South East. The pull of graduates into London, who are now coming into London even more desperately than before. I've forgotten the, the percentage of our graduates coming into London increased in each census, 71, 81, 91, 2001, even as the absolute numbers went up and up to now 2 million. Uh, so if you want... You know, London is really filling up with very well-paid, very you know, skilled people, but also people who are now desperately leaving northern towns because they, f they feel there is no work. That process of acceleration is increasing. The things that have happened since census date, it would be remarkable if they don't accelerate this particular pattern. It's almost an experiment in what happens if you do make a large Western European city more unequal. Uh, that is what we may be maybe seeing now. And I wanted to end on some positive things. None of this is ever permanent. None of these things ever carry on for very, very long lengths of time. I think we will produce projections forward for 10 or 20 years, but I would be very upset if those projections were to become true. The kind of slightly blade runner world you'd be looking at in 20 years' time, if these differences were, were to carry on, uh, is highly unusual. Uh, you have to look to a few American cities and to Singapore to find similarity. If you look at about 90% of the rest of the rich world, you don't find this. If you look at other countries in Europe, my favourite is Switzerland and the Netherlands, you find that the share of the richest 1% has been dropping for several decades. Um, people often think that the patterns we see in Britain are inevitable and they're part of globalisation and they just have to happen and this is happening everywhere. If you look across Western Europe at the moment, a lot of the policies that are being enacted to cope with the crisis will probably be reducing inequalities in many ways because the increased tax take is often being taken by the middle classes and the upper middle classes in many, in many countries. There's a question about what kind of London people want. Um, people coming into London from Sheffield and from Paris and from Mumbai uh, I've come in with enthusiasm and they want to do good and they want to um, make something of their lives and realise their aspirations. And they're coming in increasing numbers partly because other places are looking less attractive uh, to come to. But once you get here, once you spend a bit of time here, do you want London to increasingly become a kind of dormitory town that you live in until you have children, if you ever have children? Um, the uh, rate at which people are having children in some of the world's mega cities, uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai, is now an average of one child per couple. That's a halving of population in a generation. Do you want London to become a place for the young, for the successful, in which the poor are squeezed out? Or do you want London to be a place where people can actually stay with children more comfortably than they can at the moment? where the gaps aren't growing so that people on very high incomes feel that they're relatively uh, in, impoverished, even though they're actually being well paid? Or do you want it to go in the direction in which it's currently heading? Now, our job, I think, and I'd like it if you could correct me, is to take the data that exists in lots of forms. The GLA does a brilliant job of collecting the data so 
we're often taking it from them and mapping it, and just saying, what happens if this were to carry on? To give a picture, because people often just think of today, and they think of today as normal, and not the direction in which it's going in. The other question I often think is that this is not just a question for Londoners. You know, this city exists, exists within a country, and it's partly possible for this city to exist and to behave in this way because it exists, exists inside a country. In 2021, we're probably not going to have a census, it's been cut, but in 2021, we could measure the number of people who are poor in London and find out it's gone down. The most likely way in which the number of people who are poor in London has gone down is because large numbers of the poor have been pushed out of London. But you've got to think about the attitudes of people in England where those people have been pushed out to. Um, and I think this matters too. So thank you very much.